Dee Cordigalair, my name is James Nagel, welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. February of 1919 saw a number of attempts aimed at gaining Irish admittance to the Paris Peace Conference. It had been known for some time that a conference would be held at the conclusion of the First World War and attendance had become a cornerstone of the Irish independence movement. As far back as the North Roscommon by-election in January of 1917, a poster for Count Plunkett urged electors to vote for him because he is the only man of his race today who is fit to represent Ireland at the peace conference to settle the faith of small nationalities. Before the results of the December 1918 general election had been counted, Sinn Féin knew that they would have a majority of seats in Ireland and set about organising the first meeting of Dáil Éireann. Sinn Féin also sent a delegation to London, which included Michael Collins and Sean T. O'Kelly, to meet with President Woodrow Wilson, who was stopping off there on his way to Paris. They were sent to gain Wilson's support in getting a hearing for a later delegation appointed by Dáil Éireann to address the peace conference. They made a number of attempts to meet him, calling on the US Embassy, but were told by a secretary that this would be impossible. After one such failure, Michael Collins suggested that they kidnap the president, an idea which horrified O'Kelly and the others. Having spent Christmas in London, the delegation returned to Ireland to take part in organising the first meeting of Dáil Éireann. Sean T. O'Kelly was nominated to travel to Paris and secure a hearing for an Irish delegation at the peace conference. To get a passport and permit for him to travel, Michael Collins hit upon a plan to offer President Wilson the freedom of the city of Dublin. Wilson had been offered the freedom of a number of cities in Britain while he was in London and it would be difficult for authorities to refuse passports to a delegation sent from Dublin Corporation looking to do the same. The plan was suggested to the Lord Mayor, Lawrence O'Neill, and passed at a meeting of Dublin Corporation at the Mansion House. To O'Kelly's great surprise, his passport was approved following a meeting at military headquarters and he travelled to Paris, arriving on the 8th of February and securing a room at the Grand Hotel. His first action was to send a memo to the leaders of the peace conference, informing them that he was the duly nominated representative of the Provisional Government of the Irish Republic and that he sought a hearing at the conference for the Irish delegation. At the first meeting of Dáil Éireann, Arthur Griffith, Eamon de Valera and Count Plunkett had been appointed to this delegation, though the first two were in prison at that time. De Valera escaped on the 3rd of February, but he would remain in hiding until April. O'Kelly's memo went unanswered. The Paris Peace Conference had opened on the 18th of January 1919. The military conflict had ended in November, but the First World War wouldn't formally end until the signing of separate treaties by each of the defeated powers, the last of which was signed in 1923. It was predominantly representatives of the United States, the United Kingdom, France and Italy who drafted these treaties and set about shaping the new post-war world. The Central Powers had been made up of numerous ethnic minorities and Germany had considerable colonial possessions in Africa and the Pacific. Some of these were given independence, some were randomly stuck together to create new countries and new ethnic tensions which would last to the present day, while others would go to expanding the territory of the victorious Allied Powers. When the United States had entered the war, President Wilson had put forward self-determination, the rights of a peoples to decide their own government as one of the key principles on which peace would be negotiated. However, he'd forgotten to mention that this would apply only to the defeated Central Powers. As well as the Irish, representatives of numerous Allied colonies flocked to Paris seeking to put forward their claims for independence. When nationalists in Egypt, a protectorate of Britain, declared their intention to travel, four of their leaders were arrested and deported to the island of Malta, sparking the 1919 Egyptian Revolution. Korean nationalists sought independence from Japan, which had fought on the Allied side and gained much of Germany's former Pacific holdings, while the future Ho Chi Minh was trying to meet with President Wilson as part of Vietnam's campaign to achieve independence from France. And just like Ireland, all of these requests would be ignored. O'Kelly was also charged with increasing awareness of Ireland's cause with the world media, a task for which he had the help of two secretaries, Michael McWhite and Victor Collins. Very few journalists showed up to the first press conference he called, so O'Kelly and his team had to undertake a massive campaign of whining and dining the media, writing back to Dublin for thousands of pounds. They would meet journalists for dinner and lunch on a daily basis, countering British propaganda and disseminating the official line of Sinn Féin. 
McWhite, a native of Cork who had joined the French Foreign Legion on the outbreak of the war, cut a dashing figure in his uniform, which was a great help in impressing dignitaries and making the French press more receptive to them. The same couldn't be said for Collins, an ex-journalist himself, he had strong pro-German sentiments, which tended to come out in force when he had drink taken. O'Kelly mentions that a number of dinners broke up with Collins arguing with their outraged guests. British propaganda had been quite successful at blackening Ireland's name, and O'Kelly had a tough job in winning support. After meeting members of staff of the Sorbonne, he said, Ireland was no longer regarded as a friend of France. They regarded Ireland as having stabbed France in the back in the rising of 1916. The conscription crisis also painted Ireland in a bad light, and while the German plot arrests were a major propaganda coup for Sinn Féin in Ireland, they were believed in France as more proof of Ireland's treachery and support for Germany. With representation at the peace conference off the table, O'Kelly's job increasingly became to counter such stories while publicising accounts of British misdeeds in Ireland. While support was difficult to find in Europe, in the United States, Irish affairs were receiving widespread attention. On the 4th of March 1916, Clan the American wing of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, founded the Friends of Irish Freedom. Following the defeat of the Easter Rising, the Friends collected $350,000 for the Irish Relief Fund and sought to influence political bodies in the United States to recognise Irish independence. On the 6th of May 1918, Dermot Lynch arrived in the United States and was immediately elected National Secretary of the Friends. In February of 1918, as food controller of Sinn Féin, he had seized a shipment of pigs destined for Britain, had them slaughtered and sold at fair rates to the poor of Dublin. He was arrested and, after refusing to recognise the authority of the courts, the British used the fact that he was a naturalised American citizen to deport him to the US. Along with two other exiles, Liam Mellows and Dr. Patrick McCartan, he would be elected to Dáil Éireann in December of 1918. When the United States had entered the war in April of 1917, Thomas Gallagher, a member of the House of Representatives, called for Irish independence to be made a condition of any future peace, and in May he put forward a resolution to declare the liberation of Ireland one of the purposes of the present war. These were ignored by the Committee on Foreign Affairs, but in December of 1918 they agreed to a two-day hearing on Irish independence. Lynch and the Friends of Irish Freedom held a Self-Determination of Ireland Week to run during the hearings, which Lynch spoke at, and Gallagher closed out the proceedings by reading parts of the 1916 proclamation, comparing it to the principles set forth by the Founding Fathers of the United States. It was with these calls for Irish independence ringing loud that Woodrow Wilson departed for Paris. On the 22nd and 23rd of February 1919, the Irish Race Convention opened in Philadelphia. It attracted 5,000 delegates, mainly from the organising Friends of Irish Freedom, but also from other Irish-American groups like the Ancient Order of Hibernians and the National Foresters. An Irish Victory Fund was established with the aim of raising $1 million, and under Lynch's administration, this was achieved by August. The convention was attended by a who's who of Irish America, in particular, John Devoy, the leader of Clan the Gael, who had assisted Roger Casement in getting to Germany, and Judge Daniel Cohallan, an important figure in the Democratic Party, and opponent of Woodrow Wilson. At this convention, Cohallan revised the Friends of Irish Freedom Constitution, making it more American. He felt that the best way of achieving Irish independence was with a strong United States, and it committed the Friends to opposing Wilson's aims of establishing the League of Nations. This set him at odds with Joseph McGarrity, a wealthy businessman who had emigrated from Ireland at 18 years of age. Along with Liam Mellows and Dr. McCartan, he believed that all funds raised should be sent to Ireland and not wasted fighting elections in the US or opposing the League of Nations. Lynch would gravitate towards the Cohallan and Devoy group, and this was the basis for the later split that occurred over control of the organisation following the arrival in America of Eamon de Valera. One of the biggest developments at the Irish Race Convention was the formation of the American Commission on Irish Independence. Consisting of Frank P. Walsh, Michael J. Ryan, and former Governor of Illinois, Edward Fitzsimmons Dunn, the Commission was to travel to Paris and secure a hearing for the Irish delegation at the peace conference. 
Failing that, they were to try to address the conference themselves. This group was far too powerful for President Wilson to ignore, and he would have to meet with them in New York and Paris on a number of occasions. Their visit to Ireland in April would be a major propaganda victory for Dáil Éireann, but would sour relations with Wilson, and in the end, they were no more successful in gaining Irish admittance to the Paris Peace Conference than Sean T. O'Kelly was. While they failed to gain any form of political recognition beyond a few resolutions put forward in Congress, Irish-American groups would contribute millions of dollars towards the Irish Victory Fund and the Dáil Bond Drive, and would keep Ireland to the forefront of international media attention. As violence in Ireland intensified, the Friends of Irish Freedom would grow to over 100,000 members and organised a nationwide tour for Eamon de Valera. I will be covering the situation in the United States in depth after his arrival there in June. Finally, what was the reason for Wilson's opposition to giving Ireland a hearing at the peace conference? His main goals were to negotiate a new post-war alliance with the United Kingdom and to secure their support for his proposed League of Nations. When he travelled to London in December, he briefly inquired about allowing Ireland representation at the peace conference, but David Lloyd George's reaction meant that the idea was quickly scrapped. Wilson was assured that Ireland would be legislated for in a forthcoming Home Rule Bill, and he took the line in all future dealings that the Irish question was an internal British matter. Overwhelmed by calls for representation by Allied colonial possessions, he would later admit to Frank Walsh that he hadn't fully thought out self-determination when he made it a core component of post-war demands. In the end, his stance on Ireland would come back to bite him. The Irish-American lobby had considerable power in the United States, and Judge Cohallan had wielded this against Wilson within the Democratic Party. In 1920, Irish-Americans would back Republicans in the halls of power to keep America out of the League of Nations, and at the presidential election, Irish-Americans would abstain or vote against the party, helping to bring Republican Warren G. Harding into office. Sean T. O'Kelly is going to remain on in Paris until his resignation and departure for Rome in January of 1920. There will be numerous unsuccessful attempts to secure international recognition of the Republic, which I will cover briefly as their anniversaries come up, but for all intents and purposes, considering he has been such a prominent figure in the past few episodes, this is the last that we will hear of Sean T. O'Kelly for quite some time to come. The United States is a different matter, and I will cover Eamon de Valera's 18-month stay there in depth, along with the Dáil Bond Drive and the feud that would break out over control of the Friends of Irish Freedom. As we approach June and de Valera's departure to the United States, I'll cover the key figures of Dermot Lynch, John Devoy and Judge Cohallan in more detail. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Episodes will be coming out shortly on the main characters and organisations in the Irish Revolution and check out the social media links in the description. I'm sharing articles and videos on Irish history over on Twitter. Accordia, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slong of all.